Okay, well, good afternoon. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, as Hillary stated, I am the Senior Conservation Educator of the Orange County Water Authority, and um, that's how I'm representing today. But I'm also the Coordinator of Regional Nature Museums in Harriman State Park, which is a, a program that is over 102 years old. Pretty proud of those things. Um, so today we're talking about where does water come from and where does it go? And of course, we know that water comes from the water cycle, but when humans use that, we kind of change things. Uh, we interrupt the natural cycle. So we all expect drinking water to be clean when we turn on the tap, um, the hose, or turn on the shower. But human impact can change the quality of water around us, um, even if there's water everywhere. So you can look out your window and see, you know, lots of rain, or you can look out your window, there's a stream or the Hudson River or um, a giant lake, but that doesn't mean that the quality is there or that it's available for drinking. So again, most people don't think about where their water comes from. Um, it could come from a residential well, which means that it's only for one individual home or it could be for a complex. Um, it could come from a municipal well and be for an entire neighborhood, or it could come from a municipal reservoir, which would be that it would serve uh, one or more communities that it would be quite large. So um, does it matter uh, where your water comes from? Well, kind of it does. Um, so you could have a well and it kind of matters how deep that well goes uh, because there could be some complications with the depth and if there's a drought. Um, so there's that or whether or not you have confinement um, in your well to help keep you protected. Um, but the proximity of your water supply, whether from the ground or the surface, um, is, is important because it could be close to industry, it could be close to agriculture, um, and those things can um, affect the water quality. So um, one of the things that might affect that water quality is the improper storage of fuels or chemicals, um, the improper disposal of fuels or chemicals. Um, and then of course, there's always the overuse of pesticides, herbicides and fertilizers. So that would include things like parks or golf courses, um, places that would want to upkeep well and may um, overuse those things. So the first thing that you should ask is most people say to me, but like, how can I change what I'm doing or what is it about me that I can do that's different? So how are you using water in your home? Because that's a factor. Um, that's something that everyone's gonna do like every day. So uh, we use water in our home, in our showers, in our appliances, like our dishwasher and washing machine. Um, of course, there's the toilet, the kitchen sink, right? Um, you may have other sinks and toilets in your home, but Things that we do often and not really think about it um, and changing the quality of water is long showers, right? Or leaving the water running when you brush your teeth or when you're dishwashing. Um, what kind of chemicals are in the cleaners and the cleansers that you use to clean your home or your bathroom? Um, and then of course, there's things like rinsing paintbrushes and what kind of paints you're using if they're really supposed to be rinsed in the sink. Um, the operation of garbage disposal. So like when you use a garbage disposal, that's a lot of extra solid material that's going down the drain, even though you, um, you know, grind it up in, in the disposal. That's a lot more for your septic system or the sewage treatment plant to have to deal with on a regular basis. And then of course, there's things like flushing items that are not human waste or paper down the toilet. Um, things like fish, for example. I know that sounds kind of like uh, rude because it seems like the thing that people do, you know, you've got a dead fish in the tank, you, you know, take it and you flush it away. But um, anything that's extra that goes down um, the toilet bowl is going to be an issue, especially things that are considered flushable uh, wipes or cleaners, toddler wipes, those kinds of things usually are not very good for um, the, the municipal systems and definitely not good for uh, septic tanks. Um, and then you have to think about the products that you use, uh, whether or not they have um, microplastics in them. So there are some products that 
actually have tiny beads of plastic and those can be very uh, detrimental to water supplies in general because it's difficult for um, municipal supplies to deal with things that are that small. And of course, in a septic tank situation, it's not biological. So um, septic systems really um, can only handle biological items. Um, and then there's uh, synthetic fabrics and synthetic fabrics have fibers. So those are some of the things that you may not want to uh, have too, too many of them. So um, remember that the water coming in your home is also going out, right? So we mentioned a little bit about septic systems and sewage treatment plants, right? Um, and down the drain does not mean that it went away, right? So most people don't consider um, uh, that water waste is a subject of concern unless you hear about beaches that are unusable um, due to excessive precipitation or um, a sewage backup, right? So um, what you might not realize is that um, when we use too much water, if our sewage treatment plant is not prepared to handle it all, there has to be um, some uh, uh, outward flow, right? So there's some storage, but if it goes beyond that storage, then um, we've got sewage release into waterways, right? Um, and this could happen because of course, we're just using too much, um, but it also could be outdated systems that are combined overflow, which means that it's rainwater in addition to residential or industrial or um, uh, business use, right? Um, so every extra minute that you're in the shower, that's extra use on the system. Um, every minute that you're using, rinsing your dishes before you put them in the dishwasher, or that uh, you're running the water the entire time of a wash, um, if it's pots and pans, things like that, right? Um, just understand that every drop that is unnecessary is another drop that needs to be cleaned because even though it looks clean as it hits that drain, um, obviously once it hits that sewer line, it's, it's going to be combined with other things. So some good practices for water use in your home, right? Um, so one would be uh, if you choose uh, uh, scrubs, things like that, um, uh, choose natural products instead of those uh, um, uh, plastic microbeads, right? Um, you want to uh, make sure that you choose uh, natural clothing fabrics when possible, right? Um, and and if you uh, if you do have products that are uh, synthetic, then there are ways that you can help, right? So there are um, bags that you can put those garments in and they kind of control those fibers from getting into the rinse water. Um, there's a product called the Coraball. Um, it has these loopy things on them um, and that collects those microfibers. This way in the rinse, you're not emitting a lot of those microfibers into your wastewater and then into that wastewater system. Uh, because again, there's no uh, there's nothing in place to get rid of those things, and microplastics are definitely accumulating in waterways. And, and of course, you want to choose detergents that are eco-friendly, right? Um, and keep in mind, too, that uh, microbeads could be in toothpaste as well. So if you see toothpaste with tiny little dots in there, there's a good chance those might be uh, microbeads, and it may be time to consider a different brand, right? So time you shower. Right, there are cute little things that you can use to time your shower. Um, and, uh, you know, another thing that that is uh, kind of necessary is to scrape your dishes instead of washing or rinsing your dishes before the wash. Right, so um, my family actually has like rainbow collection of spatulas so that we always have a clean one, whether it's for cooking or scraping dishes. Um, and then, of course, we have compost, uh, so we are going to separate those items that don't need to go um, into the regular solid waste trash. It's going to go into our compostable trash. So um, how are you using 
water outside of your home, right? So residential outdoor water use can affect water quality as well, right? So the use of pesticides and herbicides um, that can create pollution. And, and keeping in mind that pollution is anything that makes water, land, or air unclean or unusable. But sometimes we don't think about something going on the land being connected to something that's gonna go into water, um, but water, land, and air are, are most certainly interconnected and those things need to come to, to mind. So um, many residents have flowers and vegetable gardens, right? You may have a dog kennel outdoors. Um, you may have a swimming pool, a tennis court, um, basketball where you've got more pavement, right? Um, you, you just need to be aware of those uses, right? Um, the fact that you've got these unporous surfaces and then um, in the event of kennel, you don't want um, an accumulation of pet waste in any one place uh, because again, that, that could uh, affect the, the quality of the water in, in the area, especially if you have a residential well, you wanna make sure that you keep that far away from your res residential well intake, right? Um, and then, you know, even your uh, pool drainage um, practices, make sure that that doesn't go to, to the storm drain. So another thing that a lot of people don't realize is that outdoor use like cleaning, um, so when you clean your vehicle, your house, your friends, your outdoor furniture, right? Um, so uh, washing these items can compromise water quality. So you wanna make sure that you're choosing good products, um, safe products, not just for you and your pets, right? But also um, products that are not going to harm uh, the environment. So some good practices for, um, for outdoor cleaning, right, is uh, that you may want to choose uh, a mild soap like uh, Dawn. Um, Dawn dish soap is really good alternative for um, cleaning plastics and vinyls, um, even some painted metals, um, because it, it is not harmful to wildlife. It has a short lifespan, so it's not going to do anything as it goes through. Um, say the grass surfaces, or even if it does happen to go down, not for porous surfaces like um, the driveway and into storm drains, it's not going to be as detrimental. Um, white vinegar is also a great uh, use for outdoor um, cleaning, right? Patio furniture, that sort of thing. Try to wash on porous surfaces because that's gonna make a difference too. Going down a non-porous surface like the driveway, um, is likely to go into a storm drain. But if you wash on a porous surface like your lawn, you're definitely cutting down a great deal on any sort of impact on water, right? So um, think about that when you're uh, washing um, not only your, your cars and your fences and that like that, but um, also things like your um, lawn equipment, right? So if you spray down your lawn equipment, try to do it on um, the lawn, uh, because then your any grease or things like that have a chance to go through the soil and, and neutralize a little bit more than if they went down um, the driveway and into the storm drains. Um, all right, so uh, you want to make sure also that you've got some decent practices for landscaping and groundskeeping. Right. Um, so obviously the use of compost um, and rain barrels, right? Um, and even um, rain gardens, uh, a place where your gutter is going to collect, but then the, the plants that live there are water loving plants. So rather than go from the gutter down um, a non-porous surface, it's going to go from the gutter to a porous surface and you could actually make it part of your, your landscape. Right. Um, so just uh, the the only thing to to keep in mind is that you want to make sure that you don't have many foreign plant species that might uh, become invasive species. Right. Um, you want to just make sure that your aquatic landscape is 
being taken care of is not overflowing, um, not causing any problems uh, that might release an invasive species. Because um, uh, a lot of those invasive species that are aquatic uh, have come from um, residential uh, water features, residential um, water landscapes, right? And, and we have to keep in mind that those things can be um, moved by animals like um, amphibians, frogs and toads, right? Reptiles like uh, turtles and snakes, um, although snakes aren't gonna really carry that much, turtles can, aquatic bird species, right? So if you've got aquatic bird species that visit your water, um, they're going to move things with them as they move from place to place, right? Um, and of course, if there's heavy precipitation, you don't want anything to travel to a nearby waterway, right? Um, so what I'm going to share with you now is a video that I created called The Truth About Storm Drains. Um, I created the video for elementary school children. However, I do feel that it is important for, for everyone to know. So uh, please, please enjoy The Truth About Storm Drains. The Truth About Storm Drains. Storm drains are the grates that are on the side of the roadway and in parking areas often referred to as sewers. Sewer implies that the water goes to a sewage treatment plant. Sewage treatment plants are factories that clean wastewater from homes and businesses. When you use the sink, toilet, and shower in the bathroom, or appliances like washing machines and dishwashers, dirty water goes down a sewer pipe. If you live in a city or a town, it probably goes to the sewage treatment plant. So is there sewage in the drain on the side of the road? Probably not. Drains along roadways and parking areas are designed to move water off the roadway to make it safer for driving. Too much water on a roadway or parking area can cause a car to lose control and lead to an accident. So where does the water go? Most likely, it will go to the nearest waterway, like a stream, river, or lake. Have you ever noticed how clean roadways and parking areas look after a rainstorm? The reason is that water carries anything on the pavement into the storm drain. There's bound to be some natural material like leaves, soil, small stones and twigs, but oftentimes there are other things too. Litter, from clumsiness to carelessness, litter is everywhere. Because it's on pavement, large items such as aluminum soft drink cans, plastic water bottles, and polystyrene coffee cups will get flattened, making them an easier fit through the grates. Small items like paper or wrappers have no trouble sliding through the grates. From those drains, water travels through pipes directly into streams, lakes, and rivers. When people toss items out of car windows, it appears as if the item disappears when in actual fact, they simply disappear from the person continuing on their journey. Rather than disappear, the item is left on the side of the road or blown clear into a nearby waterway like a stream. Instead of tossing items out windows, throw it away. A trash can is usually sufficient, but separating garbage from recyclables is a better option because it eliminates solid waste from our landfills or garbage dumps. It does not take much time or effort to separate trash. Litter isn't the only thing that can go down a storm drain. Sometimes soaps and cleaners go down there as well. Soap from car washing is the biggest of the causes. The soap, along with the water, will travel down driveways and into storm drains. Typically, people do not think much of the water running to the lowest point. The water and soap will inevitably go into the storm drains and away from the user. People typically do not think of things they can no longer see. The saying, out of sight, out of mind, might ring a bell. But we need to remember where the water from storm drains is likely to go. Soap and other cleaners are not good for waterways that have organisms that rely on clean water for survival. The best thing to do is to bring your car to an automatic or do-it-yourself car wash to be cleaned. If there aren't any in your area, the next best thing is to park your car in the grass and let it go through the soil instead. This will have less of an impact. Is your car leaking oil? If so, that oil can also go down the storm drain. 
Fixing damages quickly will lessen the effects. To clean up oil on pavement, you can try pouring cat litter or commercial petroleum spill agents. After letting the spill get absorbed, sweep up thoroughly and bag it for trash collection. Do animals get in your trash? How and when you put your trash out for collection can be the cause of contamination for storm drains. Be sure your cans are secure and not overflowing, especially in areas where animals are known for getting into trash. Secure lids, efficient cans, limiting the time out at the curb, and even trash can sheds can help with this issue. Not just wild animals, pet waste is another concern for storm drains. When water running off lawns and sidewalks lead to storm drains, pet waste left there can get into the water. Pet waste that is not bagged and put into the trash can not only leach into the soil, but get carried along with water, especially if the precipitation is steady or accumulates like snow. Keeping stormwater clean is easy if you know the truth about storm drains and where they leak. The truth about storm drains. All right, so um, there are some ways to keep stormwater cleaner that were mentioned in the video, right? Um, picking up pet waste, um, not littering, making sure your cans are secure, uh, trash can sheds, and of course, reducing single use items. So, um, here are some good practices for reducing litter and cutting down on, on some solid waste, right? Um, so getting products like reusable food containers or lunch containers, cloth napkins, um, eco-friendly uh, products like shopping bags and uh, produce bags that you bring with you uh, to the grocery store, uh, sustainable straws and utensils, right? Um, because the alternative is uh, it becomes easy to litter the item, right? So if you're not using a water bottle and you're drinking from a disposable container, it's like easier to, to leave it behind. I always think of that scenario of the soccer game, right? Coach passes out all the same variety of water to, to the players. Everyone has their drink during the break. They put them down, then they come back. They don't know which one is theirs. And inevitably after the game, there's a whole bunch of bottles left behind and somebody has to clean it up. So um, everyone has it within their power to, uh, to keep water cleaner. And, um, and that's, that's uh, uh, basically it for me. Um, my information is here. Um, I'm the senior conservation um, educator. So that is an email that I can be reached at. Um, we do have a website, um, not just the water authority, but also the educators. And um, I've included the uh, link to the truth about storm drains. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary Lynn. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, Dan, I invite you to share your screen now and we can continue going through this. Very good. Thanks very much. And thank you, Mary Lynn, for going through all of that material. It's a great introduction to what individuals can do with regard to water resources. Um, I am Dan Van Abs, and I've been in the water resources field for about 40 years now, which is just an amazing thing, and I'm still having fun at it. Uh, this is a little bit about my background, um, which uh, Hillary also mentioned before. And Dan, so, I'm just gonna jump in real fast. Um, if you could just go into presenter mode, please. It's, we see your slides. That's interesting. Um, it says I'm sharing screen. Oh, okay, got it. Uh, I can I can see the slides. Yeah, something happened here, so I'm going to have to stop share. And um. It shouldn't have done that. I, I think you were sharing the slides. This is Kate Weingarten. I could see your slide, your first slide. I could too. Right. Well, the problem is, I, I guess my slides were on the, my other slides were showing up on the, uh, on the screen. Yeah. 
but if it's it's okay if that's technology right it's always fun <laughs> yeah so let's try this okay does that work um it's the same but you can run through it this way all right i don't know why uh it's doing that all right so at any rate um the key here is that when you think of this from a community perspective the question is how are we going to have sustainable water systems and in many ways the water systems that we have built over the course of uh, the development of our communities 150 200 years is not sustainable at this time and so what i'm asking everybody to think about is what does your community want to be in 30 years and what part can water play in that vision if we think about municipal master plans for instance what are they all about they're about what land use goes where that's really what they're about. They're focused on the, the physical structure of a community. But we need to think beyond that because water resources are going to play an absolutely critical role in the future of our, our communities and things are changing. So where are we here? Um, we have um, shared watersheds in Westchester County. The, um, the Western part of the county is along the Hudson River. And so there are various streams that head off into that direction. On the east side, you have streams that are tributary to the Long Island Sound. And in the middle, you have the Croton River watershed, which is incredibly important for water supply to Westchester County, as well as New York City. And then you have the Bronx River going down into uh, New York City as well. Each one of these watersheds is shared with somebody else. And so they're a, a, an issue of shared responsibilities and also shared impacts. Let's go back to the water cycle that uh, Mary Lynn mentioned. Um, and this has a very simple equation is that precipitation equals evaporation plus transpiration plus runoff plus infiltration. And then people affect that water cycle with withdrawals of water and then returns of water. But one of the questions that comes up is what about climate change and how is that going to affect things? So I'm gonna talk about all of these things in my presentation. Let's start out with precipitation, the P, because after all, if it doesn't come down, we can't use it. What we're seeing is that in the Northeastern part of this country, heavier rainfall events are now twice as common as they used to be. So more of our precipitation is coming in short, sharp, heavy storms than used to be. The total rainfall has really not changed all that much. And there is no expectation that it's going to increase or decrease a great deal over time. What is going to change, again, according to the modeling, is that we should ex expect more frequent droughts not necessarily more severe droughts, but more frequent droughts. And every single one of those droughts is a stress on our water supply systems. Every single one of those heavy rainfall events is a stress on our stream systems. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Temperature. This is uh, on right hand gra uh, graph, a um, accounting of temperatures over the course of about a century in New Jersey, Westchester County is going to be no significant difference from this. And what are we seeing? We're seeing warmer average temperatures through all seasons, but we're seeing a greater increase in winter temperatures on average than in summer temperatures. And what this all does is it causes increased evaporation from hard surfaces, from water bodies and so on and increased transpiration up through trees and plants and grass and so on into the atmosphere. So again, that puts more of a stress on our water systems. For the coastal portions of uh, Westchester County on the west side and the Hudson on the east side, uh, southeast side, with regard to the sound, we're seeing, of course, sea level rise. And there's an expectation through the National Climate Assessment that sea level rise is not only happening, but accelerating. So that's a significant issue for us for the future. Moment on runoff. Um, this is a graph from the USGS, United States Geological Survey from Bronx River Botanical Garden. Um, 
And what you see is the effects of runoff. So you have a period, for instance, here in early June, very low um, stream flow through the, the um, down the Bronx River, and then you get a precipitation event. So the stream flow jumps, starts declining again. A short, sharp, severe storm jumps again and then starts declining down to June 7th. So what we're going to see is more of these short, severe rainfall events. And that means more of these low flow periods. That's going to have a stress on our systems. And all of that gets to the question of infiltration. Well, the more water is coming down in severe storms, the less time it has to move down into the ground and become infiltration or recharge. That's important because much of the stream flow that we see in these low periods is actually the movement of groundwater into the stream. This is called base flow. And it's very important for the ecological health of a stream to have this base flow. Because after all, if the stream goes dry, fish can't live. The lower the infiltration is to groundwater, the lower these low periods will be, and the more stress there will be on stream ecosystems. So let's talk about water quality for a bit. Um, one of the things that people don't tend to think about as a water pollutant is sediment. And yet sediment is one of the most ubiquitous pollutants in the United States. So flowing from either um, stream bank degradation, as you see here, or uh, runoff from agricultural lands or from construction sites or whatever it happens to be. But it does a lot of ecological damage and it can do water quality damage as well. So one of the local roles that municipalities, soil conservation districts and so on could take is reducing stream erosion and reducing the movement of sediment into streams. Mary Lynn mentioned litter, right? Solids and floatable materials coming from our stormwater systems, coming from the uh, litter blowing away in, into streams. And so there's a local role, as you mentioned, in reducing littering. Nutrients and eutrophication. Uh, this is this uh, photo is a pretty good example of a water body that has way too much in the way of nutrients, in this case, phosphorus. And so we have a local role in reducing lawn fertilizers. In New Jersey, we actually have a state law that limits the use of phosphorus fertilizers that um, creates windows of the year, time periods in the year where you can and cannot use fertilizers imposes restrictions on commercial uh, fertilizer applications. Um, so these are all ways that we can reduce lawn fertilizers. And one of the things that is very interesting, this is from Rutgers lab results. Um, they have found through thousands upon thousands of soil tests that the biggest problem with excess nutrients is not agricultural. Uh, farmers are very careful about these, the nutrients that they use because that's a cost and that reduces their profits. Um, homeowners, people who are doing lawn care, tend to use too much in the way of fertilizer. Um, the notion that if one bag is good, then two bags must be twice as good, but that isn't so. Stream impairment. So stream impairment can occur from a lot of reasons, uh, too much flow, during those short, sharp storms can damage the banks. Not enough flow, as I mentioned, base flow losses can harm the ecosystem, bank erosion, channel cutting. And then, as you can see in this photo, no real vegetation along the bank. This bank, this stream should have trees and shrubs on both sides of it, shading the water, holding the soil. There's almost nothing there. So what is a local role that you can get into is protecting and restoring riparian areas, working with a local watershed association and so on. So there are a lot of issues with regard to planning and design for municipalities, for a county as a whole, for the private sector. Um, protection of water supply availability. One of the key things is maintaining recharge. So in New Jersey, our stormwater laws and if I recall, this is true of Westchester also, if you develop a site 
your recharge after development must be at least equal to the recharge before development. And that's a really good step forward. But you can also improve recharge. So if you have an existing developed site, why not bring back some of the recharge that you lost 20, 30, 80, 100 years ago? Um, reducing runoff, keeping the water on site rather than pushing it off site. Water quality controls um, that you can get into septic system density, you can get into the quality of infiltration um, so that we're not, we're not deliberately putting pollutants into the ground. And the thinking of redevelopment as an opportunity to move toward um, improvements of our water resources, not just to maintain things as they are, but to improve the situation overall. Um, one of the things that people tend to ignore when dealing with land planning is that water supply and sewer systems have capacity limitations. And yet the planners, and I am a planner, there's a tendency to assume that the water utilities and sewer utilities will simply deal with it. Um, not always true and not always the right idea, not the, always the right approach. One of the issues that we deal with in the field is this issue of sewer, uh, is utility service area efficiency. If you have 10 customers in a mile of sewer, or you have 100 customers in a mile of sewer, guess which one is more cost effective to maintain over time? What's well, the one with more customers per mile? And so rejiggering our development so that we make more efficient use of our utility services are, is an important approach. And there's no perfect answer. By the way, there's no right answer for all of this, but there are choices to be made if we think about them. So let me talk about stormwater. Mary Lynn did a great job of talking about stormwater and I love the video. Um, we have public stormwater systems in pretty much every developed area of the Eastern part of our country. And I want to point out, we tend to think about sewer, sewage treatment plants and industrial facilities and so on being the big cause of uh, stream degradation. And I'm here to tell you that by far, there are more miles of streams that are harmed by stormwater than by wastewater effluent. Far more, probably 10 to one ratio. That's certainly the, the case in New Jersey. And so what happens is you get stream, stream, yeah, stream degradation from too much stormwater coming in all at once, these peak flows, and you get water quality issues, as Mary Lynn mentioned. You also get street flooding issues when stormwater systems are not properly uh, designed, you get loss of groundwater recharge, and let's face it, when we put in stormwater systems, we then tend to ignore them. Very low maintenance or no maintenance until they break, at which point somebody comes along and maybe fixes it. So the old thinking in stormwater was to push the runoff off the land and into the streams as fast as possible. We had almost no velocity control. The lower right is a good example of that. Poor water quality control, if any, at all. And so we have thousands upon thousands of miles of stormwater systems that are, if you design them to damage our streams, you probably couldn't have done a better job than what we've done. We just weren't thinking about these things. And so again, I raise the possibility that we can improve the situation through redevelopment make redevelopment a positive idea. So when we're talking about stormwater ideas, how do we do this? There's a concept called green stormwater infrastructure. It basically takes our stormwater system and tries to mimic natural processes, mimic the flow of stormwater into groundwater, into streams, so that we are reducing the damage done. And it means that we deal with these stormwater systems as systems, as opposed to individual pieces of technology. Focused on stream restoration, and again, the point of, of redevelopment. So things that you can do, green roofs, um, cisterns, native landscaping, grass swales, and so on, porous pavement. These are all the mechanisms that are being used nationwide. From planning and design perspective, we need to think of stormwater as a resource, not as a waste 
water. And if we think about it, right now, stormwater to our society is a waste water. We throw it away. So how can we use it as a resource? There are other issues as well. Many of our stormwater lines are designed to um, pass a 25-year storm. Well, a 25-year storm of 1970 is not the 25-year storm of today. It's a bigger storm today. Recharge protection, water quality controls, peak discharge velocities. So the faster the water gets into a stream, the more damage it does. If we can impede that peak flow, flatten that peak flow, we can do a lot of good for our streams. But we also need to deal with total discharge volume. And we need to think about stormwater as something that can provide an amenity. Taking stormwater and turning it into a lush garden, a rain garden, a park, things like that. We need to think about these kinds of things. Let me flip to the whole issue of land uses in the wrong places. Um, and so again, the local role here is for municipalities and the county and the state and the federal government to work together on hazard mitigation plans and their implementation to reduce the potential for damage, not by building big flood control structures and so on, but rather by learning how to live with water. Sometimes you need flood control structures, but often enough, there are other ways of dealing with this. And the reason I say this is because floodplains are natural. Streams by nature flood, that's what they do. And so the purpose of a floodplain is to flood. And if we decide that the purpose of a floodplain is to have development, then we're working against ourselves and we're working against nature. So how do we deal with that? Well, one thing we need to recognize is those floods are going to get bigger, have been getting bigger. And so we need to account for that. We can do improved stormwater management. And when we're going to do redevelopment, we can lift development out of harm's way or away from floodplains and redesign the whole pattern of development. So that's worth looking into. Oops, excuse me. One of the questions I would have, um, and I have this for my own community where I live in New Jersey is, are you part of FEMA's community rating system? If you are, then you will wind up doing a better job from a flood mitigation perspective, but you will also reduce people's um, flood insurance premiums, which is a good thing. How does your zoning um, and your site plan and development review ordinances deal with floodway development, floodplain development, and so on? And then similar issues with regard to applicants. They have issues they need to face, and municipalities should be working with them to make sure they do address these issues. Finally, I think finally, um, water demands. One of the interesting aspects of my work is that um, more and more evidence is out there that water demands are going down per capita. At the same time that the number of people per household is going down. And so the result is the same land areas, the same developed areas are seeing reductions in water demand on an annual average basis. My wife and I track our water demands. We have no external, well, very limited external demands. We use about 50 gallons per person per month or less in our household. So that's pretty good. Um, but it's, it's definitely going down. And what's the issue then? Well, the issue is that our outdoor uses have been going up. And those outdoor uses, when you combine that with a longer growing season because of increasing temperatures and so on, it stresses aquifers and reservoir supplies at the absolute worst time where we're getting the least benefit of our rainfall from a water supply perspective. And so there's a local role with regard to water conservation. How do we do that? Minimizing yard irrigation demands, promoting indoor water conservation through the design of the buildings so that nobody has to think about it. It just happens. Denser development, um, where you have that, you can use stormwater as a water supply for use in gardens and so on through cisterns. 
And then again, through redevelopment, you can make sure that what comes new is going to be using less water per person than what it is replacing. So my question is, is this your community vision of progress? In the 1960s, the answer pretty much across the United States would have been, yeah, absolutely. Look at that development and parking lots and cars and everybody making money and so on and not recognizing the environmental damage that we've done. So what I'm suggesting is that we learn how to bring water into communities and that we use water well, that we design with nature instead of against nature, that we use our water in a very efficient manner in a way that benefits the communities. There's some resources. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time recently looking at the Western, Westchester County planning um, site on, on environment. Great resources, really, really good site, full of stuff that you should look at. But for those who are interested in planning, um, there's a great report from the American Planning Association by um, colleagues of mine, uh, Bill Sesnick was the lead. And so they talk about planners and water. I was involved in that project. So that's it for me and pretty much right on time, excellent. So um, this is how you get in touch with me if you are interested in um, having conversations about this. And if anybody knows where the Cistern Chapel is, I would love to go visit it. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, so, and Mary Lynn, I, I would love to have you. Oh, you did. Okay, cool. You turned on your camera. Um, so there are a few questions that we can go through. The first one is actually um, if these can be found anywhere after uh, the presentations are done. In the chat, I put in a, an address to the Westchester CCE uh, website in the residential horticulture section. We have a section for presentations. And as these are done, the soil presentation that we had last month is already up. Um, and the remainder will be up as we are finishing them. Um, so one question, another question that came in is how does fertilizer and pesticide applications affect water quality? So Dan, do you want to take that on the technical level or do we want to just answer generally? Yeah, so um... So think about fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, fertilizers are, are basically two, nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen dissolves very easily into water. And so it tends to move with that water. It can either move into the ground and contaminate the groundwater, or it can move toward in runoff into a stream. And the result is, especially in coastal areas, that nitrogen will cause um, excess plant growth, what we call eutrophication. Phosphorus tends to be more bound to soil, and so it will tend to move with sediment. So it's not so much of a, a um, groundwater issue as it is a surface water issue. And phosphorus in fresh waters will do the same thing in terms of increasing plant growth, algae growth, and causing eutrophication. So um, we, you may have heard recently, there have been articles already this year on harmful algal blooms. And those algal blooms are actually um, cyanobacteria, what we used to call blue-green algae. That's why they're called harmful algal blooms, even though they're not, they're really bacteria. Um, but they can be toxic. There have been pets, for instance, who have been drinking water from ponds with harmful algal blooms and have died. So it's that level of toxicity. So it's, these are concerns for us from that perspective. Go ahead. And just, to, just to be clear, if you don't understand eutrophication, um, if you've noticed that uh, a lake or pond seems to be getting more and more shallow and more and more filled with plant material, that's exactly what's happening with eutrophication. Great. So there's another couple of questions about um, how a uh, resident, a person of the county, what can I do? Um, so can you name a few things that can be a realistic goal for a household or for a community to come together and do? 
So I can address the household. Um, I mean, reducing your own water use at home and, and outdoors is gonna be a huge, huge success, especially when it multiplies uh, with your friends and your neighbors. Um, so, you know, I'm always thinking about the commercial where you tell two friends and they tell two friends um, and it goes exponential. So um, when we start at home, that's a big deal. And um, once you start at home, then it's better um, and you're more informed to address your community leaders and to start to work with planning department. Um, and, and even so much as a community organization looking for grant money that's going to help to make those things come to fruition. So um, I just posted a, uh, uh, a response. There is a, in New Jersey, there's a, an entity called Sustainable Jersey, which is a certification for municipalities. And there's also a certification program for schools, I should mention. They have a whole lot of ideas for municipalities to use the same ideas apply um, to anywhere in New York State or, or pretty much anywhere in the, this whole section of the country. So if you're, if you're looking for ideas, there's some great ideas there that could be useful. Riparian area protection, stormwater control, a um, whole series of issues with regard to litter management, you, know, you name it, they, they pretty much have it. It's, a, it's an excellent program. Great. So um, there is a few questions about how to try to handle runoff. Things like wood, um, putting down wood chips or mulches help. Also, um, some lake communities that have chickens, how do you um, recommend ways to manage the manure and how to prevent it from getting into the water? So I'll take the chicken question because we raise chickens. Um, take those chickens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we compost our, our chicken waste um, and it, it actually will, um, will accelerate, you know, the rate of decomposition uh, with the regular household compost. And then we use it in our garden, um, but we, we make sure that it's matured. So, you know, even if, if someone is composting strictly lawn waste and chicken waste um, and, and waiting to maturity then using it in their own beds, you're gonna make a big difference than, um, than not. Um, of course, free range chickens, there, there would have to be quite a few of them to, to make a big impact um, if, they're, you know, if, if their waste isn't contained. But, but that's what we do for, for our poop is we, we compost uh, chicken waste. So in terms of runoff, um, for those of you who are homeowners or are involved perhaps in a homeowners association and a condo association, first question for you is, where do your roof gutters and leaders go? Do they go onto paved surfaces or do they spread the water across a lawn surface or into a wooded surface or into a garden or something like that? So the absolute first thing is get that water off the paved surfaces. Give it the maximum chance to infiltrate into the ground or to be used by plants. So that would be my first suggestion. And if you can go the extent of having a cistern and use that water for, um, for, lawn, uh, for garden watering purposes and so on, great. But at the very least, give your water the chance to move into the ground instead of across impervious services into the street drains. Thank you. So there's another question um, about uh, vernal pond health and how that kind of plays a role in here and if it does. Um, it, it can, it, it really depends on what, what use is around that vernal pond um, because Certainly there are, there are things that are going to damage fragile egg structures like from um, amphibians, right? So you, if you know that your runoff is going there, then I would definitely consider diverting um, so that you're, you're not interrupting that, that very important cycle of reproduction. Yeah, so in the New Jersey Highlands Council's regional master plan, uh, that I helped um, work on, 
uh, we have a 600 foot buffer around vernal pools. No development whatsoever within that 600 feet. Those are one of the most fragile types of wetlands out there. They're almost impossible to bring back once you've damaged them. So um, stay away. <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. Uh, there, it's very, very difficult to create a new vernal pool that works ecologically. When it's gone, it's gone. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for answering all the questions. I'm just going to uh, see if I can share my screen one more time. <laughs> so, um, so up next, like we said, is the urban and suburban uh, landscapes. What can go wrong? It's spread. It's in two sections: um, health of our suburban forests and a plant's perspective, common diseases and insects. But what I would like to do right now is thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you so much, Dan, for coming and talking with us today. It was so informative. Um, and like I said, this will be up at the website, the CCE Westchester website that I put. In the chat. Um, you can watch it again at any time. If you have any questions, it'll have um, our, our information. You can always reach out to the CCE um, at any point through email or phone call. We're always here for you. Um, and you'll also have Mary Lynn and Dan's information as well if you had any specific questions for them or us. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And again, thank you, Mary Lynn and Dan, for doing such a wonderful job uh, presenting for us today. Thanks for having us. Have a great yeah, summer. Thank you for <laughs> having us. Of course.